A very good day to you and welcome to our presentation of biblical truth that we believe is going to make a difference in your life. If you don't know it, if you do, you're going to celebrate with it like I do when I present it. And I'm very grateful for this opportunity once again of being able to share some of the things that are the anchors in my life because the Bible has become a book over 30 years of my life nearly um, that has really brought me to an understanding that if we look at only this world, we're in trouble because it doesn't work the way we would like it to work. It can work for many years, but we are going to face crises. We're going to face difficulties and we're not going to make sense of the world until we have the greater picture and perspective on it. So I'm Paul Weiss. It's my pleasure to do this. And I certainly hope that you are able to take from this, not only uh, information, but I hope that you apply it to your mind, that you, you anchor it in your mind that these are biblical truths. And today I'm going to be taking from the Bible once again. I'll put the verses up. And they are, to me, these are some of my, I wouldn't say my most favorite verses because the Bible is full of verses that are absolutely beautiful. So there's, there's no part of the word of God that is not the word of God. However, there are some things written for us and there are many things written directly to us. The truths for today are what we really have an interest in. So we have the Sunday message that goes out. Normally it's posted on Facebook at 8.30, but it also goes out on a WhatsApp. And it's also on YouTube if you would want to. If you haven't heard previous verses, you're welcome to get hold of Facebook or YouTube. Or you can even email us and we'll see if we can send them to you some way. I'm not the greatest on technology, but I know it serves us very well at this stage. And then, of course, there's also... Um, on a Tuesday, there's a Bible study where I'm dealing with the scriptures particularly um, so that we can understand why they are trustworthy. And then, of course, there are details there to get a hold of myself. My wife is Janice Weiss. Um, she does the teenagers in the church, etc. She's been a wonderful support over the years. But then Lauren is my sister. <clears throat> Excuse me. And Lauren... And does a lot of the admin. She does the prepping of the, the technical side of this message. So I also want to thank the Lord for those who understand the beauty and the absolute privilege of the gospel. So I'm going to be sharing with you today a follow on. We've done five sessions on salvation. Now, salvation is being saved in a nutshell. We are saved eternally from the condemnation of the judgment of our failures because God is a just God. If he didn't do that, he wouldn't be worthy because he would let anybody do whatever they like, including harm you, harm your children, whatever. So God has put in place systems in our world. They may not honor him. They may not be pleasing to him, but we have the law. Now, God doesn't work in the law of the Old Testament, but what he does do is that there are principles that if we fall into the wrong trap, they are going to overcome us and they call it sin and sin is any rejection of the things of God, whether it be firstly a rejection of his teaching, his doctrine, his existence, his structure of how to trust him and be saved. But when we are saved, salvation takes place. But there's a beautiful few verses that have always been really exceptionally beautiful in their, what they portray in the security that we have. And I'm going to touch on, on two of those in Ephesians. There's also the one I touched on, uh, which is Romans 8, 38 and 39. Um, I may still touch on that. However, what I am going to do is that I'm going to touch on these things today. Okay. What I want to do is just move to the, the screen. And when I do so, um, I want to look at some of the notices. Remember, there are no church services Although we in South Africa and in Port Elizabeth, we have the right to have 50 people, up to 50 people in a service. Um, it's just we've got elderly people. We've got folks that have said that they will, they will handle it as it is for now with getting this message. But uh, no church services. There's our Bible study on Tuesday I drew attention to. And then I've had some responses to last week's message, which was the same. And that is telephonic or email assistance, including counseling. That's one of my strengths because I've dealt with so many people. They have equipped me besides and primarily the scriptural take on how we should treat one another, love one another. But today, what I want to deal with is the fact that we are sealed. Once we are saved, 
it is not a temporary, it is not a possibly going to get us to heaven. It is an absolute, and an absolute, absolute it is. And God gives us the reason for this. And Ephesians 1, 12 to 15 are probably some of the most beautiful words in what they portray, because they give us the incredible wording that Christ gave to Paul the Apostle to write to us and to bring home to us what has happened since we chose to trust Christ, that he died for our sins and that he made us complete in Christ and that he did the work, not us. It's a gift he gave us, as the book of Romans explains and many other books. It's not something you earn, not a reward you get, but it's something God gives us. And then what it goes on to say is that in verse 12 of Ephesians, Paul is writing to the Ephesians. It's a lovely book on, on, on doctrine, in which is the teaching of Christ. And in so doing, he puts these words to paper inspired by the Holy Spirit. And as he does so, these are the words that he writes, written by the Holy Spirit, written by the inspiration of God. And he says that in verse 12, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted Christ. Now, what does he mean who first trusted Christ and to the praise of his glory? Well, Saul of Tartus was saved and God gave to him a new message beginning in the book of Romans is Paul's writings. And when he says of glory, who first trusted Christ, there were many in the kingdom presentation Jesus gave where he wanted to set up a kingdom on earth and fulfill a prophecy to Israel that excluded us as Gentiles. But he says, no, now that God has made this message known, which he calls him uh, the revealing of the mystery, which was kept secret until he gives it to the world. So he's got a special and a unique message. And if you took Paul's writings out of the Bible, do you know you couldn't say to somebody, you need to trust Christ died for your sins was buried and rose again. That's only found in Paul's writing. So very, very essential to get this right. Anyway, then verse 13 of chapter one of Ephesians says, in whom you also trusted. And I, I, would, I would sincerely pray that that speaks of you personally, not just those that Paul is writing to in the book of Ephesians. And it says, after that, you heard the word of truth. You see, you'd have to have something that is the word of truth that you then trust, which is the gospel of your salvation. Now, the word gospel means good news. So what he's saying is the good news that you have had, you trusted in it because you knew it was the word of truth that was given and given with evidence of what God was revealing at the time. So he, he says that. And then he says, in whom also after that you believed, and ye is a plural word. By the way, I'm going to say this quite often in my presentations. The Bible in the King James Version uses ye's and these. And everybody says, well, buy a Bible that doesn't have the these and the thou's. No, don't ever do that. You're making a major mistake. Because ye is a plural of you people or you. God, Christ used it in terms of the nation of Israel. And his primary focus was the nation, not the individual he might have been speaking to. Bear that in mind. I promise you it's going to change the way you see many of those scriptures. But what he says, and the reason that we retain it, is that he says, in whom also that ye believed. He's not speaking to an individual. He's speaking to those at Ephesus, which is where the book of Ephesians comes from. And then it says, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So the Holy Spirit wasn't just a spirit, that God's spirit that's placed inside us. It's not only something that God's spirit now leads us through the word of God into his purposes and plans. But what he says is that you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Promise of what? Promise that you're saved. Promise that you're going to get to heaven. How do we know that? Because he goes on and explains it. In verse 14, it says, which is the earnest of our inheritance. And the word earnest means it's almost like the deposit of our inheritance. Now, that means that if you are saved, you have an inheritance. You have something that is due to you because Christ has promised it to you. And he's placed the Holy Spirit within you. Nothing can remove the Spirit from your life. If you are saved, your Spirit is made alive and united with the Holy Spirit. But you are also brought into what Paul clearly defines as being in Christ. And in Christ, that's where 
his righteousness affects our lives. So doing what is right is not just keeping the law, because the law would have brought righteousness if we could keep it, but we can't keep it. And anybody who's tried to keep the law within the human nature is almost a rebellion. If you're told to do something, you struggle to do it because you don't want somebody telling you what to do. Now, the law kind of had a similar effect. And what happened is that Paul writes and he speaks about grace. And he speaks about the laws of grace, which are not you will do this and you will do that. But it's the work of God's love through the offer of giving us a relationship with him that will outlast this world into the glory of eternity. So he says, which is the earnest of our inheritance. And this is the key word that's so beautiful. Until. Okay. So he's going to seal us. He's going to make us his. Until. There's something going to happen in the future that the Holy Spirit within us is the guarantee. It's the deposit of what God has done. And that's where he says, until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Did you know that if you trusted Christ because you believe that he did take your place in the justice of God, where God had to punish sin and he took it upon himself and he lost his life because the wages of sin is death. So death was the consequence that he faced, but he faced it for us. And that's why in his personal capacity, he had no sin. He wasn't under that consequence of the wages of sin. And when that happened, he actually took our place. And that was why he died, but unto the praise of his glory, whereby he has saved us by what he did and taking our place in the judgment of, of God's sin. Uh, God's consequence to sin, should I say. And then it says, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints. And he goes on, and in verse 15, what he goes on to speak of is that he ceases not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Then he goes on in verse 17, um, which I don't have on the screen, but in verse 17, what he actually goes on to say, and I'll read it out of my, my Bible, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, he gives him a status. The Father is the Father of glory. That's why when people turn around and say, well, God must be punishing me, or God's doing this, or God didn't cause my child not to be hurt in an accident or whatever. God is the God of glory. But there are practical consequences. If you and I, and we both believe in Christ, and we have two people who deny them any kind of God, they atheists, they don't believe there's anything more to this life. Let me tell you, if we throw a soccer ball into the air, gravity will have its principle. If we are driving through a red robot and there's somebody coming through it, whether we are super spiritual or not, we're still going to have an accident. So there are principles that exist that are not determined by our spirituality. But what he says, is that, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you, because he already had that, but what does he say he'll give unto you? The spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Now that's where the growth of the Christian life comes. To be saved saves your soul from a lost eternity. But to live meaningful in this world and to be used of God and to be an instrument and to love him, that you just share what his glorious gospel is because it means so much to you firstly. When that happens, that is when we get to the point where as we grow in the understanding of the word, as we are able to separate it and make sure we don't take commandments and take instruction that was given, for example, to the nation of Israel in the Old Testament and try and apply it today, when we get to a point where we can see the distinctions and the differences of what Paul has already said, even in this, the, the revelation of the truth that he had, which was distinct from what Jesus had taught on earth, by the way. Um, that's a big statement, but it's got a beautifully big answer that is key to not becoming confused. Because there are many people who are claiming all sorts of things that God's going to do this, Jesus is going to heal me, Jesus is going to do that. Jesus is going to fix my business. Do you know how many people I personally know who've been to see pastors in a church where they're confused about how God works today because they're trying to make the kingdom of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which had very different principles, the order of the day. And let me tell you, when those people go bankrupt, they turn to God and they say, 
what was wrong with me. You didn't come through for me. Or they say, I failed you because I didn't have enough faith. And let me tell you, when a business is failing, a man is going to give every part of his faith to that to survive, to make his business survive, because intrinsically men are providers and provision is their biggest, biggest sense of purpose and worth. And believe it or not, the reality is that men lose their confidence if they retrenched. It's absolutely frightful. I dealt with a man, and I'm sorry to share this with you, but I'm telling you that he also let that instinct get out of sync. He met a girl, she had a one-year-old child, he married her, he loved her, and he gave his life for providing for them because he had taken them on as those he loved with a deeply, deeply entrenched love for them. And you know what happened? He was retrenched. So he got another position. He was retrenched some months later. And do you know what he did? The daughter was 12 years old. And he went along and he took his own life because he had an insurance policy that he knew would pay out. And the provision for this young child that he took on as his own became so significant that he actually made sure that his insurance payout would provide for her. Now, he would have provided way more than any financial thing. He could have gone through that phase. He could have ended up with a job that was maybe not as good or maybe even greater than the job he had had and not get retrenched. But he was so anxious that that's what he did. Now, those are some of the human nature aspects of, of, of people. Some men are so lazy, they're happy to be layabouts. Um, but there are not many of them around. But what actually happened in this situation is that in this situation, what he, what he ended up doing was that. Now, the point is, Paul is writing about a purpose that extends beyond this world. Nothing would have replaced the love that he had for his 12-year-old daughter. But I mention that just because there are principles in life that apply that are crucial, but we mustn't overplay them either. We must get a balance. But what I'm saying is that that man's confidence as a man was lost. And it doesn't matter whether you're the managing director of three companies. You get retrenched three times, you think you've got no capabilities and you lose your confidence. Unless you know that, and for us in South Africa, we live in different circumstances, we live in different politics, we live in a whole range of different things where in actual fact, females are recognized more than what men are. But anyway, that's a whole different subject. Now, getting back to what Paul writes, he says that when you trust Christ because you hear the word of truth, and I love that expression, the word of truth, not just the Bible. Many people say, I know the Bible backwards. Well, you should try and get to know it forwards and to understand it as it's rightly divided into what is written to you and what is written for you. Now, the entire Bible, let me say this categorically, and I need you to hear what I'm saying because there are often accusations made if you say that that was written to us through Paul's writings and that was written to Israel through Jesus Christ's life and prior to that was the prophecy and I touched on that either in the Bible study or last week's lesson but what I want to say to you and it's incredibly in, incredibly important and that is that the whole Bible is written for us we need to have all of that understanding but it doesn't mean we take the promises from every passage because there are many we couldn't do. Jesus Christ's primary work was to tell people to sell everything, become a part of this kingdom and God would provide. That's why the Lord's Prayer and the verses after that in Matthew 6 speak about the bird, the sparrow, doesn't, doesn't build up a, a great substitute or, or substance of things for tomorrow. He lives daily because God provides. But we are not the sparrow, number one. Number two, we're not in the kingdom. But Jesus said, if you seek to follow me, then sell everything you have, and we'll have all things common is the term. Anyway, I did touch on that in another talk, but I just mentioned that. So let's get back to the deposit. This is the part that is absolutely beautiful. When you trust Christ, he places his Holy Spirit in you. The Bible says he makes you one in Christ. In other words, we are, we are with Christ. We are one in him. We are part of what the Bible calls the body of Christ, and I'll maybe touch on that next week. But the body of Christ is made up of many different members, but we are all sealed by the Holy Spirit. Now, there's another verse that I want to take you to. But what I want to say is that when you are saved, the day you are saved, nothing can take the Holy Spirit away from you. Nothing can 
ever rob you of salvation. And the key part to this whole thing is that when God seals us, which is the word that he uses, we are saved and we are Christians. Now people say, what about the people who walk away from Christ? What about those who were Christians and now they don't want to be Christians? And there are many of them, make no mistake. Can I tell you, often the church puts them under such pressure and the church ignores to teach them the security that even if you fail God, it just reminds you that grace saved you because we all have human nature. And if we should walk away from Christ, I can promise you, and I'm telling you this categorically, you can like it, you can lump it, you can smoke it in your pipe. The truth is, if a person walks away from Christ, they have never heard the gospel clearly. They have been saved by their own performance in a veiled way. It's like you have to not be a sinner anymore. That's not the question. Christ died for every sin we ever will commit. We don't sin as much as is possible, and we still do end up sinning. There are things that we do that attitudes, etc. if we're in a bad mood. But what happens is that we measure by our performance. God doesn't. He measures by the performance of Christ. And when Christ died in our place, the righteousness of Christ is attributed or imputed to us. Now, I hope that you can grasp this because, you know, when people get sick, the first thought is, did I do something wrong? Is God punishing me? Is there maybe God is trying to point me somewhere? No, God doesn't work that way. He doesn't punish us. And I often say to people, if Christ should punish us or God should punish us for our sin or doing something wrong, let's face it, we could be a bundle of ash in the corner and that's all that would be left of us. So he doesn't punish us because he punished Christ. And to the person who rejects that, he doesn't punish them in, on earth. Sin may punish them because Satan loves to make a false promise, offer you something, and it never works out that way, whether it's marriage, whether it's somebody who's very deceptive in how they tell you that we're going to go into business, but they're actually wanting to get your finances into their sinking business. Maybe a thousand things. Those things are true, but they are not God punishing us. The punishment of the sinner and the unbeliever is not in this world except for what sin will do to him because the man who deposed books and i've seen it many times um in people who have been they've been fraudsters and boy when they're taking that money and they think they're earning this big money because it's coming out of the company they are very arrogant they are very 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 self-imposing but let me tell you when they sit in a court case and they have been just heard the word guilty they cry like babies because Satan has a way of offering, giving, but then there's a trade-off. He draws you into an unrighteous, ungodly, illegal system if you're willing to go. Now, thankfully, there are many very good moral people that are not Christians, but true holiness and righteousness comes from Christ. And that's where, when we are sealed with the Spirit of God, we are made one in Christ. We are part of what he calls the body of Christ. Now, that's not a physical body. He's talking about the spiritual entities of every person that makes up everyone internationally, worldwide, that is within the body of Christ. So as I touch on this, there's one more verse that I want to go to as we conclude. But what I want, my objective of this, is that you should know, if you trust Christ, first of all, Know why you're trusting. Get the evidence behind the fact that the book of the Bible is 66 books and it's not just sacred writings. There's a much more true thing, and that is the living God has not only compiled it, he's, he's actually also preserved it, but we trust it because it's written for us. And then there's Paul's writings are written to us, but together, they give us the total insight of where we're going, where we came from, what's happening, and they make life make sense. But we have to know why we believe, not just what we believe. I hope, you, I hope you're with me on that. Anyway, let me go to this last verse that says that we are sealed. And by the way, what it says is that when you are sealed, until, this, until the redemption of the purchased possession, we were purchased with the blood of Christ. He shed his blood on our part and God judged him and he bought us the gift of eternal life. So we were purchased with his blood, but then it says, as I, as I, as I mentioned earlier, it says that um, we were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession. So we belong to God. 
we don't belong to ourselves. We don't belong to the world. We don't belong to Satan. We belong to God. But it's up to us to download from the scriptures what that means. And that's why we have these talks. Now, I want to just draw attention to one other thing that is so beautiful. Do you know if you go into a shop and you purchase something and you put a deposit on it, do you know it doesn't matter what you're buying? That is your possession once you've paid a deposit. But you don't have it at home yet. If it's a lounge suite that your wife wants in the shop, maybe it's a dining <laughs> suite, who knows? But do you know what happens? Is that when you put that deposit on it, legally it is yours, but you don't have possession of it. Now, that's exactly what this is talking about. We belong to God, but we are not the redeemed possession yet, but we will be. That's why the Holy Spirit of promise is he promises us heaven's our home. We will spend eternity with God. We will spend eternity with loved ones that might have gone before us, that may come after us. But it is an absolute promise that is trustworthy, but it is empowering in our lives as well. And you know, sometimes we have people that can turn our lives upside down. Um, I've had some conversations recently about things people have done where they've been absolutely dishonest. They've been intentionally, they've had a desire to gain from something. And you know what? They can do whatever they like. If they have Christ's forgiveness, they won't be desiring to do that because they would fear failing God. But if they're not saved, God says, allow yourself to be defrauded because vengeance is mine. And God will bring them accountable for that. So it's an interesting scenario, but I mentioned it in passing. And I want to go to this last verse because it's really a beautiful verse. Um, and that is Ephesians 4, 29 to 30. And that says, and I'll put 29 in as well, because it's a beautiful verse on the Christian. And he says, let no corrupt communication. Now, corrupt communication is not just being angry or saying harsh words. It's also not sharing anything that is not truth. And many people are taught the wrong things where they taught things God will do that God will not do because he is writing to the kingdom, the nation of Israel, the people that he was dealing with at the time. Um, so corrupt communication has to do with biblical truth. It has to do with speaking graciously, that your grace is seasoned, uh, that your speech is seasoned with salt. The Bible uses that term in Paul's writings as well. And it says that let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. And that little three-letter word you'll find now or but, uh, it's those little keywords that are going to give you a beautiful contrast. So it says don't do that. But that which is good to the use of edifying, and edifying is building up. You would know that you have an edifice, and edifice is a building. So edifying is to build something up, build people up is what we build up that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And then he says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit. And the word grieve is to not, don't disappoint him. Don't make him sorry by what you're doing and what you're saying, because he longs for you to live in the righteousness of Christ, because you're going to spare yourself many things. And he says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Now, that's the key, the day of redemption. We're living in an imperfect world. You're going to face problems. You're going to face illnesses. You're going to face a whole lot of things that people can do to you by their choices that are not honorable or godly. But what I want to say is until the day of our redemption, which is the day that we leave this world and we enter heaven, we are purchased. God has put a deposit in us. We are his and we can handle these things because we don't build our whole existence on the earthly things. We enjoy them. They are given, and I don't have a problem. I enjoy riding my motorbike. I should never ever say this, but I've still got a motorbike after my accident. I haven't ridden it as much, but the point that I make is that I get pleasure out of that. And I just, some of you know, a buck jumped in my way, it saw my lights, and buck jump into the the headlights. Um, so when I'm out of town, I'm going to be very much more careful. But it's a pleasure. I thank God for it. If I have it, I have it. If I don't have it, I don't have it. It's not a problem. And I trust that's how you live life. Because I live, I breathe. My existence is about this message that I long for people to live in the confidence and the assurance that this brings. So to you, I say today, I trust that you know you are saved, 
not because of anything you could do, can do, will do, other than trusting Christ, which Paul says in Romans 4, 4, and 3, 4, and 5, we are not, it's not a work. Trusting is not a work, so it's not our works. But what Christ worked at, which was getting to the cross for our sin, that is what we believe, we trust it, we place our confidence in it, and God then seals us with the Holy Spirit. I hope it's been meaningful. May the Lord richly bless you in the security and the praise and the honor and the glory that we give to God because of what he did. And remember, God never had to do it either. There's some people who assume God had to do that. No, he didn't. He chose it. And choice reflects love more than anything. As I mentioned either in my study or last week, the truth is that choice, when a man asks a woman to marry her, uh, to him, um, sometimes the other way around these days, but <laughs> nonetheless, when he says, will you marry me? It is his choice in choosing her that is the reflection of his love. When we choose to trust Christ, it is knowing he loved us before we make that decision, that it's not just an empty decision we make in case it's true. Uh, we could maybe, if that isn't true and we go to hell, you could say that some people may trust him just as fire insurance so they don't go to hell. That's not why we trust him. It's because he, what he did to spare us that, that reflects his love in his choice to do so. So I trust that you're secure in that, but I hope you will never doubt your salvation if you trust him. Now, many people say, but I'm not sure if I trusted him. You know what I say? Do you want to trust him? Do you desire to trust him? And they say, oh, yes, absolutely. Well, if you desire to trust him, then that is a sign that you are not rebelling, you are not rejecting, but that you desire it. And maybe you don't understand as much as you might, as another person might, but just rejoice in the salvation and the security of being sealed by God's Spirit, because you are His, and He will see you through one way or another. The Lord bless you. Mm -hmm.